So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to keep this very light and very fluid. And I'm expecting, of course, you know, you, the audience, to um, ask questions as we go along. Um, the first part will just be, you know, just looking at some back history, blah, blah, blah. But then we're going to definitely um, talk about, you know, why we're why we're picking the stocks that we're going to recommend. Or, or actually, I shouldn't say that. Um, that we will be purchasing. You can purchase at your own. At your own. Um, I cannot recommend any any positions for you. But we'll be talking about you know what why we're doing the things we're doing. What is driving us to pick the companies that we're going to choose um, for the next five to ten years? And there's going to be um, companies that will be in in my personal portfolio, and this is what we're going to look at will not even are not even created yet. Okay, so. Um, doing research for for to por for our portfolio, there have been a lot of company startups um, that are private that are just um, ripe for takeover. Right, they're they're ripe to be bought up by Amazon, bought up by waste management. That's why I was talking about waste management earlier today. Being by, bought up by all these other companies, where we can, you know, I I can see some of these companies, some of these technologies really come to light in the next you know two three years. And some of these companies that are more established, more more take them on and and you know use some of their um, disruptive nature as as part of their their process as well. So I th I think um, we're going to see um, the portfolio. Of course, I'll share with you, and we'll go over all the stocks on there if you guys want, and, and what and why I'm doing it. But um, I, I think it'll be a really great way to um, talk about what it means to be, um, what, what it means to have a longer term portfolio, what, what it means to kind of hold stock and kind of look, you know, 10 years from now, instead of just focused on the day to day and the uh, minute by minute. For those of you who follow us on Discord, who are follow our daily daily trading, right, our, our um, or at least recently, um, the, the the ones that things we've been alerting have been day, day trades, right? Five minute charts, one minute charts, hourly charts, you name it, it's all been day trades. But, you know, the profits from those day trades go to those leap options. Like, for example, NEO, we, we got to a leap option for NEO. We purchased a leap option for American Airlines and Carnival Cruises, knowing that in the next year or so, those industries will be coming back up and getting back to pre-COVID levels, hopefully. And those those stocks that are now have been being down for so long, may start to get some um, movement going and our leaps don't expire until 2022. So between now and January of 2022, um, we have a lot of ways to go. And I think those options will will pay out, you know, I'm expecting at least 100, 200% return on those positions in the next one year. So um, we have that going for ourselves as well. Okay. Um, what this is not going to be, let me see if I have that chart on here. Yeah. So what today's call is not going to be, guys, it is not going to be um, day trading. This is not a short-term portfolio that we're talking about. Now, on your own, uh, you can, um, you know, play this short-term if you want, uh, or some of the stocks that we're talking about based on our analysis. That's no problem. Um, but... that is not the intention for us um, in this call. And this is, and of course, you can, you can buy leaps on using this as well. But again, our focus for this call is no leaps and you're not gonna be buying uh, uh, periodically. This is going to be, you're going to buy something every, I mean, the same stocks, but you're gonna put in every single month. It's like a car payment, it's like a mortgage payment. You have to keep money in the market, whether it's up or whether it's down, you gotta keep loading it in there. Because when when it when the time comes to move up, your average will be a decent average, and you can definitely be successful when that happens. And then of course we can talk about you know when to add more, when to add less. We can definitely talk about those things using the technical analysis that we've been doing, um, you know, recently or we've been doing forever. Um, I do want to start off by recommending this video right over here. And this presentation hopefully will be available to Discord uh, very shortly um, after the call. Uh, this video is by Tony Saber. I really like this guy. He did a new one earlier this year, um, which is really cool as well. But this one really talked about 
the disruptive nature of Tesla and just the automobile industry itself, um, how the automobile industry has been a disruptor. And actually when it first came, um, it was a major disruptor in the world, taking over, of course, horse and carriage, right? And, and at that point, and at that time, when the first car was created or, you know, made for the masses, there was a lot of, um, you know, people didn't believe that it's going to take over the world. I mean, they, they thought it was too expensive, kept breaking down, didn't make any sense. A horse will always be there when you need it. And then uh, we'll look at the, the pictures in a little bit, but that really has changed um, in, uh, in just 10 years. So uh, the next two slides are copied uh, from this presentation. So I do want to give it credit um, and do recommend you go ahead and check this video out. This is the link right here. So when you have that presentation, you'll have that link available to you. It's a YouTube video. So this is a, and for those of you who've already seen this video, you know what I'm talking about. This is a picture from 1900 and it's a picture of Fifth Avenue, New York City, right? So in 1900, uh, you see there's only one car and everything else you see horses and buggies, carriages, people walking everywhere. Um, and that's only at 1900. When you go to 1913, same street, 13 years later, one horse on the side, all cars. In 13 years, the world changed from horse to car and with it created whole new industries. We're talking about tires. We're talking about automobile parts. We're talking about body shops. We're talking about dealerships. We're talking about mechanics. We're talking about everything that you can think of that can go on a car. A new industry was created, disrupted from whatever it was doing now. And from those come from the, from that disruption, now you have Goodyear. Now you have, uh, you know, uh, AutoZone. You have, uh, you name Discount Tire. I mean, all those companies that are, that, that you come to think of have roots in this transition or this disruption from 1900 to 1913. The Model T, it's, Model T itself, I believe, was created in, or first was 1908, 1909. So. Um, this this is the era that we are living in right now when it comes to companies like Tesla, right? When it comes to coming up, now you're seeing Ford, Chevy, uh, I don't want to say Nikola, but Nikola, right? Uh, coming in and looking at the EV space or Volkswagen, I should have said Volkswagen, looking at the EV space and saying, okay, you know what? That's the future. Um, the writing's on the wall. They're not going to admit it publicly, but you could tell by their actions if it if if Ford is going to take a name brand like the Mustang and make it an EV SUV crossover, um, that's that's serious stuff. I mean, that is very very serious stuff for them to do that, and I think um, uh, that's a move in the right direction. So our focus, and I'm gonna go back to our our main page here. Our portfolio's focus is these three things: disruption sustainability and growth. Growth is gonna be something different. Growth, uh, you, you're probably thinking um, growth as in okay, a small company and getting into a bigger company. No, I think growth, I think Walmart is growth. To be honest with you, and we'll talk about why. I think Apple is growth. Uh, sustainability, I'm talking about sustainability of the, of the supply chain for a disrupting company. I'm talking about EV batteries, recycling, um, or uh, rare, rare earth materials. Um, and then, of course, when, when things have to go to waste, waste management, too. So we have to look at that point. If an industry is going to disrupt from a horse and buggy to a car, um, where's the trash going to go when all that stuff happens? Um, and who's going to sustain the supply chain to make sure everything is, you know, working properly? And then, of course, disruption at the very top. Those are your Teslas, your squares, your, um, you know, crowd strike or crowd um, – Salesforce, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll talk about those as well. I do I do want to, uh, let's see if I can get there really quickly. So we talked about that, I saw that. I wanna recommend a book. So a lot of times people ask me, hey, uh, what book do you recommend to read um, so I can get you know better at stocks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's no book you can read to become better at trading stocks. That is it, just, a, you have to practice. That's the best way. And stockcharts.com has, um, uh, what do you call that, um, charting school. And I'll share that link later. Great resource. That's how I first got started. 
but you have to understand the mindset of a company and a great leader. Once you've identified great companies and great leaders, investing in them is the easy part. You just got to put your money in those companies, right? But in identifying who these great companies are and the great leaders that are driving these companies, that's the hard part. And I'm going to show a really, uh, really quick video clip uh, from, from Simon here um, that really talks about his experience between Apple and Microsoft. And um, this is why I'm so excited about Apple. And even though I don't own that many Apple products, um, I love the company and um, I love everything that they stand for. So let me, let me go ahead and play that clip and we'll watch it. It's only three minutes long. Okay, and let me just go theater mode. Okay, I'm just gonna ask you guys if you guys uh, in the chat box, once I play, just let me know if you guys can hear the sound or not. Um, that way we'll know uh, we got everything going. Okay. I spoke at a leadership summit for Microsoft. I also spoke at a leadership summit for Apple. Now at the Microsoft summit, I would say 70% of the executives and this was under the Steve Ballmer days. I would say about 70% of the executives spent about 70% of their presentations talking about how to beat Apple. At the Apple Summit, 100% of the executives spent 100% of their presentations talking about how to help teachers teach and how to help students learn. One was obsessed with their competition, the other one was obsessed with where they're going. So at the end of my presentation at Microsoft, they gave me a gift. They gave me the new Zune, which was the competitor to the iPod Touch when it was a thing, right? And I have to tell you, this piece of technology was spectacular. It was beautiful. The user interface was incredible. The design was amazing. It was intuitive. It was one of the most beautiful, elegant pieces of technology I'd ever seen, right? Now, they, it didn't work with iTunes, which is an entirely different problem. I couldn't use it. <laughs> But that's something else. <laughs> I'm sitting in the back of a taxi with a senior Apple executive, sort of employee number 12 kind of guy, and I decide to stir the pot. And I turn to him and I say, you know, I spoke at a Microsoft summit, and they gave me their new Zune, and I have to tell you, it is so much better than your iPod Touch. And he turned to me and said, I have no doubt. Conversation over. <laughs> because the infinite player isn't playing to be number one every day with every product. They're playing to outlast the competition. If I had said to Microsoft, oh, I've got the new iPod Touch, it's so much better than your new Zune, they would have said, can we see it? What does it do? How we have to see it. Because one is obsessed with their competition, the other is obsessed with why they do what they do, the other is obsessed with where they're going. And the reason Apple frustrates their competition is because secretly, they're not even competing against them. They're competing against themselves. And they understand that sometimes you're a little bit ahead, and sometimes you're a little bit behind. And sometimes your product is better, and sometimes you're not. But if you wake up every single morning and compete against yourself, how do I make our products better than they were yesterday? How do I take care of our customers better than we did yesterday? How do we advance our cause more efficiently, more productively than we did yesterday? How do we find new solutions to advance our calling, our cause, our purpose, our belief, our why every single day? What you'll find is over time, you will probably be ahead more often. Those who play the infinite game understand it's not about the battle, it's about the war. And they don't play to win every day. And they frustrate their competition until their competition drops out of the game. Every single bankruptcy, almost every merger and acquisition is basically a company saying we no longer have the will or the resources to continue to play and we have no choice to either drop out of the game or, or merge our resources with another player so that we can stay in the game. That's what that is. And if you think about the number of bankruptcies and mergers and acquisitions, it's kind of proof that most companies don't even know the game they're in. You want to be a great leader, start with empathy. You want to be a great leader, change your perspective and play the game you're actually playing. I love that clip every single time. And, and you know, I have a personal experience with, with Apple and, um, 
and Microsoft. Actually, it was HTC at that point. Uh, when the iPhone first came out, I was working for Sprint uh, in sales. And um, uh, I think HTC launched their first touchscreen phone as well. At the same time, the Apple iPhone came out. And the sales guy from Sprint kept telling me how much better their phone was because of the uh, this app, and or not even the App Store, but this thing and that thing. But what he didn't really understand was that the, the goal was not the phone. No one cared about the phone. They cared about the possibilities that came from having that phone, the the Play Store, the uh, the apps that we use now, the way it's connected to our world. That's what the exciting part was. I didn't care if it was faster rotating that screen from one screen to the other. I was more amazed about the potential of what this is going to do 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And so that's that's the that's the thing that we have to look for, right? So when you look at companies like Tesla, let me see if that's the next screen we can, yeah. When you look at companies like Tesla, they don't care about what Ford is doing. They don't care about what Nikola is doing. They don't care about what anyone else is doing. They know what they need to do to win, and that's what they go and go get it. Um, that's the same thing with Apple. And with a lot of other companies that we're going to talk about today that have the same type of mindset where they're not looking at the competition and just trying to get to the competition. They're trying to look 10 years down the line and say, how can we make sure we are the main competition for everyone around us? So before, before we move on to the, the, the stock list itself, let's kind of talk about compound investing and what that really means and how much sense does that make um, you know, for, for us at this point. So I just brought this, uh, made this real quick, you know, just, we don't need this part, a little spreadsheet. And I talked about this morning, right, that you don't need um, money to really get started, right? You just need to get started, and that's the main thing you need. Um, so I have scenario number one and scenario number two here. And scenario number one starts out with 10000 So if you have $10,000 right now, you put into the portfolio of all of the 10 stocks that we're going to talk about. And then every single month, you put in 250 bucks. Right, two hundred fifty dollars every single month, no matter what. Think of it as a car payment, as a mortgage, or rent, or whatever you want. And you could do, um, and you will have to use fractional shares. So Robinhood does fractional, Fidelity does fractional. Um, I think M1 does fractional. So you just take two hundred fifty bucks and invest it in those five companies every single month. Right. So you'll probably get like point zero one percent of a stock, which is fine. And you do that for ten years you would have invested about $40,000, right? So that's $3,000 a year for, for 10 years, plus your $10,000 in initial investment that you're gonna start off with. Or if you don't have 10,000, you could do 5,000 down just today, and you put in 500 bucks a month, right? Every single month, no matter what, you put it in, in the same stocks, you'll end up investing 65,000. So, the, the end is not this, right? Of course, everyone knows 65,000 is actually uh, 15,000 more than 40,000. What's your point? The point is that when you're investing every single month, and I'm gonna do just a back test of the last 10 years with Apple, right? So for, let's say you started this in 2010, and now it's 2020, December you know 30th or whatever. Um, so now it's time to see what your portfolio looks like. Uh, let's see what that $40,000 has gone you. So Portfolio Visualizer, those of you who, who come to our calls know this website. We, we like it to do a lot of back testing, um, especially with, with key portfolios or even a mix of portfolios. But, you know, this is your 20, 20, 20, uh, 2010 to 2020, and we're starting with 10000 bucks, and we're depositing or investing $250 every single month, right, in Apple. So let's say we got Apple 10 years from now, and that's what we did. Your forty thousand that you at the end of ten years out of your pocket, you had ten thousand forty thousand dollars come out. That portfolio right now will be worth four hundred thousand dollars. Think about that, guys. You're putting in two fifty a month. That's all you're doing for the next ten years, and because this is a growth company, because it even pays out dividends and it and it just keeps having, you know, record highs after record highs. And look at Apple, just looking at Apple, they're coming with a car soon. They're coming up with a software for car. Your iPhone is going to be your car, is going to be your key in your house, it's going to be everything in the next 10 years. 
that's where Apple is going already, and they've kind of let 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 um, the world know about that in very very short order. But your initial balance of ten thousand, investing only two hundred fifty bucks in just this one stock, is now worth four hundred thousand dollars. That's huge, guys. That's huge. The second portfolio that we talked about, and this is um, this one right over here, where you're just putting in 500 bucks a month, you start with 5,000, put 500 bucks every single month, you are going to end up with a uh, drum roll. And I'm just show you this, uh, make sure I got that right. Yeah, we're starting with 5,000. So starting with half and you're putting in 500, uh, which is double of your monthly uh, would have been because you're only putting in half to start off with. Let's, let's look at this comparison of the two. And in doing that, you have increased your portfolio by $110,000. That's, I mean, it's, it's easy as that. And of course, your worst year, you're down 5%. Your best year, you're up 90%, which is probably this year. But you could see throughout time, right? Your portfolio just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's going to be very easy after you know three years, you cash out at forty-eight thousand. It's going to be very easy to do that. But then if you let it grow, guys, for ten years or more, it can easily get up to that five hundred. I think this one was what five hundred and nine, five hundred ten thousand bucks. And we're just talking about Apple here. We're not even looking at. I mean, okay, you know what? Now I'm, I'll put in Tesla here, and you guys just. I'm telling you, it's going to be a crazy, a crazy, crazy number. Um, 2.4, 2.5 million dollars. A 10-year investment in Tesla, starting up with 5,000, and just investing 500 bucks a month in Tesla, month after month after month. Uh, this portfolio will be worth 2.5 million dollars. So, um, this is no joke, guys. And this is the power of compound investing, or power of investing in general. The day-to-day -day stuff that we do, yes, it's fun. Yes, it's a little risky, and yes, yeah, we'll get some. We'll, we'll get a good, you know, hundred percent, forty, eighty, ninety percent return here or there. But you're you're not putting in fifty grand at a time, right? So, the the point is for for data strike in general is we're going to make money um, in those day trades, in the short term trades, but the, and those profits get funneled into our our longer term investments. And the longer term investments, you can see for yourself can grow to a substantially large amount um, very, very quickly. 10 years will come and go and you won't even know it. Um, and if you can t just take your total investment of 65,000, turning it into 2.5 million, um, that is absolutely no joke for a 10 year position. So Tesla, you know, for, for all of you who are aware, um, has not even started yet, guys. So, I mean, yes, it's at 700 now, adjusted for, you know, the split, you know, it's at 3,500. But think about what's coming up next in the next 10 years for Tesla. I mean, this first week in, in uh, January is going to be a big week for them. We'll get the Chinese delivery numbers out, and that's going to help us determine if they're going to hit that 500,000 number for the year. If they hit that number, 500,000 number, I'm expecting Tesla to go over 800 bucks because next year we have their semi coming out. Next year we have Cybertruck coming out. Next year we'll have the refresh of the Model S and the Model X. And then hopefully that $25,000 car coming out towards Q4 of 2021. In the meantime, rumors of them going into India, rumors or not rumors, but actuality of the, the Germany factory um, coming online. Guys, if you, if you think Tesla is high now, next year, it's going to be at 1400 bucks. No questions about it. Minimum. Next year at this point, it's going to double in value. And if you're investing one every single month, 500 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month, your investment will keep on growing not only for this year, but for the next 10 years. And there's 10 other companies that we think are going to grow um, just as Tesla is growing now, um, at least in the next 10 years. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Can we uh, see the, uh, what the second portfolio would be? 
just compared oh, yeah. with yeah. Tesla? With, with Tesla? Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, so we're starting with 10,000 and putting 250 a month. And And by the way, guys, this website's free. You guys can, anyone can log into Portfolio Visualizer and use it for free. Um, Two million. The difference is 500,000 bucks, pretty much, or 400,000 bucks. So you invested 15,000 less and you missed out on uh, $400,000. That's, that's an expensive uh, 15,000 bucks. So, um, I mean, and it goes to show you, right? It doesn't really matter what you're initially starting off with, right? It, it doesn't matter because you're, you're starting with less. Let's say you started with 500 bucks, okay? You're starting with 500 bucks and then every month you put in 500, not even 5,000, 500. Two million bucks. I mean, because the, the, the majority of the growth for Tesla, right, happened, happened in end of 2019 going into 2021. But you're building up your portfolio for this move. When, when, when the world finds out about it, that's when the move happens. And by that time, you have a thousand shares in Tesla. And when it goes from, you know, I, I think at this point it was like 500 bucks to 3,500, you're making 2 million bucks uh, pretty much in one year. So that's, that's the reason why uh, I think like, I mean, we look at it right here, the worst year is down 11% which is a, a, a decent loss for our day trade anyways. Um, and the best year is almost 600%, which is most likely this year. And you can see it is this year. Um, but this whole time, you're, you're just adding on to your position. You're not losing, you're not gaining. You're just hanging in there right under 200,000. And then at the at midpoint of 2019 or May of 2019, you're sitting at 125,000 midpoint of 2020 you're sitting at 579 in the meantime you've already added sixty thousand dollars worth of shares to this and then of course now you're sitting at 1.976 and i think tesla has a lot more to go remember they're talking about they only have five hundred thousand cars imagine when they're in that the market caps in the trillions um that's going to be huge uh, they're going to have hvac systems they're going to have uh, Solar City finally is going to be building homes. I mean, they're going to be in every single part of your life in the next 10 years. And I think that's going to be, um, I mean, if using this is cool, we'll do this again in the end of next year, and you'll be blown away by how much that 1.9 uh, would be one year from now. So um, I think now is the time, guys, uh, to get in on some of these stocks. And we'll look at some of these next. So, my, my, this, this, this will be my personal portfolio. Uh, and so those of you who have followed us for a while, I've, I've only talked about five, right? Amazon, Apple, Tesla, Square, and Arc. Um, you guys didn't even know I was looking at all these other ones, but I think now as we're getting closer to January start date, and we'll, we'll do our first trade, hopefully tomorrow, if not next week, um, we're going to officially start the long-term portfolio. And on Discord, we'll have a section for it as well, so you guys can follow along. Um, we're starting with Tesla, right? So Tesla, we just talked about Tesla, so we know what that's all about. Let's talk about Square. So the banking sector is ripe for disruption, especially when you have crypto creeping up on them, especially when you have um, things like uh, people not even wanting to go to the banks anymore to do anything, uh, because I, I, I personally hate going to the bank. Um, my business accounts, my per most of my personal accounts are all online banks. I don't have anything except for Wells Fargo in a physical location where I need to go to get something. But other than that, it's, it's all online because I don't care to go inside. I'm not going to use them to open up a CD. I'm not going to use them to be my investment partner in anything I'm doing. I can get loans online from, from other banks. Um, that, that old bank model is archaic now and Square and companies like Square are going to change um, the world when it comes to um, investing in something like this. If you look at Square and I'm going to replace Tesla with Square, okay, so we're doing that 500 bucks, $500 a month um, and right, uh, Tesla was 1.9 million. 
Square, believe it or not, has had a record-breaking growth, right? So when we look at Square for the last 10 years, and so we can only compare for five years, right? Because Square wasn't even a company uh, before December 2015. So for five years, you're going, you're putting in close to 30,000 bucks and a five-year return, you're getting $234,000. And you're starting with 500. Actually, as a matter of fact, if I go back to my, let's go back to that Google sheet and we'll, we'll make it so that we are looking at apples to apples, right? So you're putting, starting with 500 and you're putting 500 bucks a month. And so you are looking at, yeah, total investment of 36,000 bucks. So in the, in the five year time period, you've put in 36,000 and now this portfolio is worth 234, 38,000 bucks. That's a pretty decent return. And you can see Square has been moving up consistently and this looks like a break. And now, I think now, this is going to be the way that Tesla moved up, is that pivot point to the next level up. Um, you, think, you think Square is expensive now, uh, wait till it's 500 bucks in the next two, three years. Uh, wait till it hits 1,000, because you know it's going to do it. It's going to eat Wells Fargo, uh, Citibank, uh, JP Morgan. It's going to eat their lunch, and it's going to be the next way that people transact um, in this country. It's a very small player but it has a large market share you can eat up and every single dollar that it eats up, the stock price is gonna go higher and higher. So that's why Square is on my list um, as a disruptor technology for the next 10 years. Okay, what's next? ARC, okay, so no explanation on ARC, right? So ARC uh, KK, for those of you um, uh, follow ARK Invest or even follow us at all. We love ARK, right? Because they are disruptor ETF. Tesla, Square, Apple, all of those companies are in their ETFs in one form or another in one ETF or another. So we'll do a whole new segment on ARK just separately and I'll do some videos on it as well on why I love it so much. PSTH, so this is um, a, a volatile play in the portfolio. PSTH is, is a, is a, um, uh, you know, reverse merger IPO, where they don't really have a company yet, right? So um, the, I, I think we talked about this one before. I, I forgot the guy's name, but he's very famous. He's a hedge fund manager. Um, he has this open holding of PSTH ready, and he's waiting for a company to take public. Pretty much like what, um, um, you know, they're doing with Open Door, what they're doing with some other companies. Um, this PSTH will be replaced by a company that this person thinks uh, or wants to, um, um, you know, take it to the next level. So PSTH will do a video on that one as well. PLTR. This is not only a meme stock guy. So PLTR is a really great uh, company that I think is just on the cusp of making profit. I think next year is going to be the year for PLTR. It's at 25, 27 bucks now. Guys, it's going to be in the hundreds in the next two to three years. Um, and that's why PLTR will definitely be a part of the portfolio. As a matter of fact, PLTR, we will be buying some long-term leaps for 2023 um, in the next couple of weeks. So PLTR um, will be there as well. Um, Airbnb, we've laughed at by Airbnb going IPO, right? Or the price of the uh, the stock as soon as it opened, went up and down, went up and down. Um, this is going to be a big disruptor. Uh, I cannot explain to you um, how hard I've tried not to stay at an Airbnb. I just didn't trust it. Um, but now it's the complete opposite. Because now when I want to go on vacation, especially with a larger family, um, a hotel room is not going to cut it anymore. I, ju I can't do it with the hotel anymore, right? So I, I need a like a four bedroom house that I can just you know rent for a week or so. Um, and usually in a very residential area in in another country where I can get all the anonymities I want at a at a cheaper price rather than staying at a tourist location and being upcharged for for a bottle of water. So I think Air, after Airbnb kind of cools down, Airbnb, Airbnb will be part of our, our long term portfolio hold as a disruptor in this in this. Um, space. Uh, SPCE, for those of you who know this Virgin Galactic, um, I think the future is in space. Um, and to be honest with you, um, 
not not just um, you know space uh, travel, but I'm talking about um, sending supplies, satellites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all that stuff is still going to be going on. And with Tesla, hopefully, if there's a spinoff of SpaceX, which probably there won't be, but we're getting all that, you know, somewhat in Tesla for some, some I, I, we're affected, but not really. But SPCE, I think, is, is better than Blue, Blue Origin, which is Amazon's um, uh, uh, company. And I think that's going to be, uh, we got to have something in our portfolio in the next 10 years um, to touch space, especially because we're going back to the moon in the next five years. So, if, if the plan for the U.S. is go to go back to the moon in the next five years, uh, space is on the horizon and we are going there. And I think space is going to get us there. It'll have us up and ups and downs, as we saw recently when they rescheduled, came back down. But we can, we can definitely buy some long-term leaps on this one. And, of course, stock as well as it starts to grow in the next five to ten years. IPOB, open door. Um, so I think the the name officially changed to OPEN now. Uh, I, I know it's going to change in December. I'm not sure if it changed it or not. But IPOB um, is open door, and that's going to be the next way a millennial or a Gen Z buys a house. Um, no more going to a real estate agent. You can. I'm sure that it won't go away completely. But if I can go on my phone, get approved, and just go walk to the house, take a tour, understand it, and negotiate down on the app itself. Now, I hate negotiating as it is. And if I think it's a good price, I can buy everything without having to see someone, um, shake someone's hand, or even just deal with people and paperwork, I'm in. Yes, I'll pay an extra percent for that, um, but I, I can do it anywhere I want to be and not, ha not be inconvenienced by the paperwork, printing, sending stuff, and all that crap. So I, I think open door uh, is is the future of home buying and selling. Of course, you'll still have um, realtors um, do this stuff as well, but it's going to take up a lot of market share, uh, definitely. For TDOC, that's Teladoc. It's a Dallas company, if you guys remember. Uh, this is your telemedicine, right? In the age of COVID and beyond, um, I think telemedicine is going to be the way to go, especially if there's a push uh, in this country for for um, a public option in healthcare or even a public healthcare system like the NHS in Europe uh, or UK. Um, I, I think the hospitals don't have capacity and the doctors don't have capacity to take everyone in physically in their location, especially if COVID is still an issue down the line. Teledoc is telemedicine. And I think it's it's uh, one of the leaders in his industry. It's worldwide. It's international presence. And that's going to be the future of medicine, at least as you interact here with your doctor, um, uh, especially when you're for the day-to-day -day things. You know, when, when my daughter was born, uh, we, we had a nurse through Teladoc um, in case my wife had any questions. It could be three o'clock in the morning and a nurse somewhere in around the world will answer and know exactly what's going on with us when, from reading the notes and be able to help. Um, and that was that was an amazing experience with Teladoc, and it, that company's continuing to grow, um, you know, as it's moving further up. So, um, Teladoc is is a great great um, uh, stock as well. And I mean, you know, when you, when you talk about disruptor, this I mean, Teladoc is not really a disruptor anymore, but it, it I should probably move, move it back to sustainability or the growth um, section. But it's there. It's there. Um, so now let's talk about sustain and in this context with the stocks that we have, and of course, there's going to be a lot more coming as the world continues to change around us. Um, we're seeing the, the starting points of growth in the EV world, right? Tesla's coming up with 500,000 cars. Uh, we have Volkswagen pushing for more cars than your future. Um, and then of course, Ford, Chevy, um, and I guess I'm going to say Nikola, just as a, just to be funny, um, all pushing to have cars come out uh, in the near future. Well, you have to mine uh, a lot of materials for that stuff, right? Right now, China has the overall market for rare earth materials. I know there's some market in Australia, but China's trying to get over those mines as well. Um, and we'll start with MP. Uh, MP is... Um, leading it or it wants to lead the uh, the rare metals uh, project in the US. So they are fighting right now uh, to be the go-to company 
when it comes to rare metals and um, other stuff for e the EV market in general. Um, same with, with, with um, DM. They both are in the same space as far as making sure the materials, the metals have to do with supply chain. Um, and of course, how we reuse those metals down the line and what we can do with them. If, if Redwood um, was a public company, I would have them in there. And those of you who know Redwood is a company started by an ex-Tesla uh, executive and, do, and they do recycling for, for lithium ion batteries. Um, headquarters is right next to Tesla's uh, space in, in, in California, but they're not a public traded company, so we can't really invest in them. Once they do, they will be on the list. But I think waste management is is at a really good spot to take over some of that um, space if they choose to do it. Right now, I'm not seeing a big push with lithium ion recycling or even recycling of those kind of metals. But I think waste management has the infrastructure, has the space, has the contracts and the connections um, that they can uh, really take over some of these smaller startups and fill that space very, very quickly. Some of the, some of the um, startups that I was looking at earlier, um, you know, this week and last month, all had to do with waste management, believe it or not. Not the company, but just the idea of waste management. And it was, it was about uh, how to better plan your routes using AI, uh, using real life signals, um, having automated uh, trash trucks driving around, um, having, um, uh, smart trash cans, um, dumpsters in, in businesses where it can alert and set up times for pickups uh, along the way. So you're not, so the business is not paying for an empty trash can to be picked up when there's nothing there. Um, the sensor will allow the, the, the garbage truck to know, okay, this one's halfway full. It's time to schedule it in. It'll schedule it in. So it, it, it better helps understand what you're picking up. It saves a business money and it helps um, the landfillers better plan or allocate space based on what type of garbage is coming in, right? So garbage coming in from a, from a, um, a manufacturing plant is different than coming in from McDonald's. So it's a really interesting concept. Waste management is a very, very exciting field, believe it or not. Um, I'm very excited about waste management in general. Um, but when you look at waste management in, in, in countries like India and in Pakistan and you know, Bangladesh and, and stuff in those countries where there's not really a concept of waste management yet, but is getting there in the next 10 years. And I think waste management opportunities in those companies will be, or in those countries will be really great or will be really high um, as their population grows and as they get expensive taste. And of course, with electric cars and all those stuff coming through, um, there's going to be a lot of trash uh, that needs to be picked up and there'll be trash no matter where you go. And the way the world is growing, all that trash is getting just more and more expensive, more recyclable, which again goes back to, you know, some of the other companies that are recycling and selling refurbished lithium ion batteries, et cetera, et cetera. Tesla doing the ex exact same thing right now, but that's a really exciting space. That I'm really excited to dig into in the next two or three years. Um, and of course, there's a lot more to come, but we're, we haven't identified good ones yet that I can put money in myself. Growth. Um, so when you first think of growth, you don't think of Walmart, right? Um, Walmart is, you know, I asked my wife the other day, what do you think, what do you think Walmart is? She goes, well, groceries. And it, sometimes the groceries are really bad. Um, you know, I, I, I was telling her that Walmart to me in the next 10 years, it's going to be a technology company. It is not going to be what you know of Walmart today. It is going to be a um, company or a Walmart store. You will not be walking into a Walmart store in the next 10 years. I think so. You'll, you'll pull up and you'll get your groceries put in your car by someone after it's been picked inside of a Walmart because the Walmart inside will be made, made like a warehouse now. And that's how you'll get your groceries. You'll get them delivered or pick up, but no more going inside because the people inside those Walmarts, the workers, um, they're, they're just a commodity. When you be believe it or not, that's how they're treated. That's how these employees are treated as a commodity. They're replaceable, um, but they get sick, especially during the world of COVID. They get sick. Uh, they go on strike. They take lunch breaks. They take bathroom breaks. Um, robots don't have to do that. 
a, a efficient warehouse system does not have to do that. Do I morally agree with taking away jobs? No, but I know it's happening. I know Kroger um, is already taking that next step. Uh, I think one of their locations in Ohio, somewhere up there, is already just a warehouse. Uh, it's a Kroger store. You just drive in and groceries get delivered and you leave. That's all you do. They have smart technologies inside that Kroger that reorganize the shelves, um, alert what needs to be missing. I mean, it, it's just a whole, they did a whole project just on that one. And I think it worked out really well. And I think you can see Walmart, Sam's Club, Costco, all of them take technology to the next level and become more of data centers of people's buying habits. And who do they sell those habits to? To advertisers, to other companies um, within, uh, within their supply chain, their the distribution chain. So that's what Walmart's going to be. Walmart is also trying to compete with Amazon now of, of having resellers on their website. So if you ever go, if you've been to a Walmart website, the website still sucks, by the way, it's not easy to use at all. Um, but when you go there, you can buy stuff that's at Walmart or from some retailers or from resellers that are not Walmart affiliated, but they're private sellers that you can buy from. So Walmart is creeping into that space and they have the infrastructure, the physical locations to really deliver something that Amazon, um, even, even though they, they were successful without it, um, are now trying to find avenues where people can pick up things from drop boxes and stuff like that. But I think Walmart has a pretty, if they can use their distribution points and their, their physical locations to their advantage, can be a growth stock. And of course it pays out dividends, so why not? Right, so a lot of our like waste management, Walmart, Apple, Ford pay out dividends. So even if their stock doesn't really climb as fast, those dividends will be reinvested every quarter anyways. So you could always get a little bit more down the line. Uh, Arc G, of course, is part of the Arc uh, investment group. And I think it will be Arc G and we'll do uh, Arc K is also just uh, Arc W is also another one that I like, but we'll do a whole separate session on just ARC investments because I love them so much. I'll come to uh, Ford after Apple. So Apple, and, and this is why I, I like Apple so much, and we looked at it a little bit right here. I'll go back to this Apple one, right? Oh, let's go back to this one. So uh, I'm gonna go back to and look at Apple. And I'm going to compare this, and you, you could do a benchmark to the um, the Vanguard 500, right? So that's that's a safe investment that people like to go into. Um, so, and this is just a oh, 1985. Let's go, no, 2010. We'll we'll, we'll do that 500 again. We want to do that 10,000, 500, 500, and analyze portfolio. Okay. So we have a 10 year portfolio and you could see they both are moving in the right direction. It's the most recent time where the S&P 500 or you see Apple kind of deviate away from the S&P 500 and it starts to grow on its own. And at the end this year, particularly, there's a really big gap between the two as they begin to go their separate ways. Of course, Apple is part of the S&P 500, but when you look at the returns guys, if you were just to get the Vanguard 500, you would have made 160,000. Now, of course, you're only investing, you know, 40,000 or actually $60,000, whatever it is, um, to get 159 is not bad for 10 years, but you're missing out on growth with Apple at 427,000 um, just by putting $500 a month, starting with 500 bucks. So this is why we're staying away from the S&P 500, SPY, Qs and stuff like that they're not worth our time because there's no growth opportunity because they have 500 stocks in them. Uh, if five grow and the other 495 don't, it's not gonna grow uh, with the market. But when I look at Apple uh, in particular, um, and this is that red or the blue one, what has Apple done so far that's taken them from, you know, from here all the way here? And you can see how, you know, their, their, their stock is rising. They had Mac, right? Mac was, was going on for a while anyways. And then the iPhone came out and you could see some bumps along the way when it had, you know, iPad, iPhones, um, uh, iPads, et cetera, et cetera. And so now 
they are now going into the service industry, right? Services is now taking up more and more of their revenue or making up more and more revenue. Hardware is still there. Yes, the new MacBook with the chips are amazing, I've heard. Hope to get one soon. Um, the new iPhone 12 is amazing, I've heard. Um, but the service that they're offering, the Apple Fitness, the um, the music, uh, all the other services that they offer um, is taking or is bringing in more and more revenue. And as people start to use those more often and as they get their new chips out and all that stuff out, it's going to be more and more part of people's lives in the next five to 10 years. And you'll see the cost related to hardware and um, my, my expertise is in manufacturing um, is, is very, very high, especially when you have, you know, your production place in India right now that's, they have strikes going on for Apple. And then you have China kind of getting kind of iffy on, you know, Foxconn and stuff like that. Services, you don't have to worry about any of that. It's all in the cloud. It's all in the air. And everyone already has your hardware, right? So I think as services get more and more part of the Apple infrastructure, I think this deviation from the S&P is going to be a lot higher in the next 10 years will be off the charts for Apple. Secondly, um, the Apple car, right? So of course, we don't think it's going to be a physical car. They may merge with Fisker or kind of have a partnership with Fisker, rumors. But that's another space that, that is not built in in the last 10 years. That's a whole new space, a whole new market section that no one's even putting into the market price right now for Apple in the next 10 years. If Tesla is going to come out with um, autonomous vehicles doing taxis, don't you dare believe, think they'll be the only ones doing it, okay? Tesla cannot physically build enough cars to, to really control that market for the long term. Volkswagen is going to come in, Ford is going to come in, uh, Uber is going to come in partnering with someone else. And then I think Apple will come in as well. If Apple can come in and provide the software, and I think the Project Titan from day one has been about the software, if they can get that right, um, then they can be um, at one point take over market share from Tesla as being the number one company for software when it comes to autonomous vehicles, when it comes to other things that have to do with autonomy, driving, et cetera, et cetera. So it's gonna be a whole new world. It's gonna be an amazing world. I mean, not, not, I mean, we're not even including guys smart cities, right? When you have, when you have um, uh, road signs that communicate with cars, when you have stoplights and, and stop signs that are smart signs that communicate with cars um, and, and can, can control the flow of traffic without having anyone sitting in a command center doing so at the city center. I mean, those, that's going to be the next 10 years. And you could see countries like Singapore and even Amazon for, for a little bit are, are, are looking at countries of the, or cities of the future. Toyota has a smart city that they're working on. I think Abu Dhabi is working on a smart city. The problem with that is by the time they think they have a smart city done, technology has already shifted so much that they have to start all over. But that's going to be the next 10 years. I mean, you know, my kids, when they grow up, I don't think I'll even have to buy them their first car because they won't want that responsibility. They're like, no, I'll just call an Uber. It's cheaper. I don't have to pay insurance. I just pay 10 bucks every time, every time I go somewhere. A subscription model for Uber, 10, pay 10 bucks a month, get 10 rides. I mean, think about some things like that um, are going to be the future. Apple does have an advantage in all of that. All that new space is the hardware right? Your phone is going to be your car. Your phone, when you come inside the house, depending on who walks into the house, and I think Apple can already do this now, will control the light settings, set the TV station, set the radio to whatever your preference is, just by knowing who's walking into that room with what device. That's going to be awesome. And that's going to take a lot of infrastructure change, which I think Apple will benefit from. I'm so excited about this company. You have no idea in the next 10 years. So Apple definitely is a big buy. But again, you know, when the iPhone came out, um, Android was not far behind, right? So Android, um, yes, uh, they still have their uh, quirks and the Pixel line is a great phone, but they just could not get to the same level as the iPhone. And, and I think Apple has, and that's why Apple is not on this list, if you, if you see that, 
um, is because they try they try so much. They they go they're not concentrated. Uh, this is like the video we, we heard, um, you know, about Apple and Microsoft. You can you can you can switch Microsoft with with Google, and it'll be the same thing. Everything Apple's doing, Google's trying to copy, and they're doing a shitty ass job at doing it. But they're doing it enough with enough quality that they still have a, a, a people buying their the soft the Android software. Samsung is still already working on their own. Huawei already has their own software that they want to play off of Android. So even that may be in jeopardy now. So that's why Google is not on this list because, it, it, excuse me, it may already be in one of these ARC funds anyways, and I'm not gonna waste time on that company right now. But Ford is, and Ford is like a 10 buck, $10 stock last I saw. Um, Ford, I, th I really think has the, has the opportunity to be a number two manufacturer for electric cars. And I'm talking about after Tesla, right? So Ford, the CEO of Ford, um, for a long time has been pushing for electric cars, believe it or not. I've, had, I've heard interviews with him from two years ago. Um, of course, he didn't like Tesla, but he knew that the future was in electric cars. And he was pushing for the F-150 electric, not the Mustang electric, but, but more, more of like the folk, uh, fusion electric kind of thing. Uh, or a focus electric, but um, you know he's he's trying to lead, or that company has been trying to get to this level um, for a while. Volkswagen is also there, uh, but I think Ford, after Tesla, um, knows that change is coming and is trying to do its best to really turn that company around. Not to mention it's a seven dollar stock, so if they get bought out by Tesla or something, someone else. It will be okay for us if you're holding a seven dollar stock, um, but I think Ford really, especially with the Mach-E that's coming out, and the F-150 electric that's coming out, um, if if they can if they can hold on to their base, um, then, then that's one less company that Tesla can really take market share from, and and I think that's going to be a really cool thing to see in the next 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 ten years. I don't think GM is going to survive, guys, in the next ten years. The way GM is right now, I don't think it's going to survive they can make that big shift over. Volkswagen may have to spin off uh, for, for an electric company on their own. Um, they can't really, they're too big to, to change fast enough to catch up to Tesla. Because by the time they do, Tesla's gonna have like 10, 10, 10 new factories going. And um, why, wouldn't you, why wouldn't I buy a Model 3 for 20 grand um, or a Volkswagen Jetta for 15? I, or a diesel Volkswagen Jetta, right? Uh, for 15,000. So uh, th this is our list right now. And yes, you know, you may be thinking that how the hell am I gonna invest in all of these companies? Um, doesn't make any sense with 500 bucks. Fractional shares you can. And and, and trust me, uh, it, it feels weird looking at 0.0001% of Tesla in your account. But you know what? Every single week that you open it up, every single month that you open up your app, it's going to be a green number. It's going to be a positive number because, a, you're going to get dividends as well, and then once you build this build this up substantially enough, uh, especially when the market starts to move again, going up, going up, you're going to see those big days come through. And ten years from now, you're going to be a lot better for it um, going through. Now, what, will I be getting in all of these at the same time? No, probably not. Most likely not. Um, but if I had to choose the core, right? And I'll just highlight the core that I that I like. Um, and of course that, and then, and then Apple. Apple, mm, I'll highlight them. Apple, Square. Actually, you can even do this for, for um, and Square is included in that. So you can, you can highlight that one. Tesla for sure. And uh, this one, and probably a couple more. So those will be the ones that I will start my portfolio off with. Um, and then all of these other ones, as I see time, or as I see movements coming through, I'll start adding on. What I mean by movements, I mean by downturns in their stock, right? So for example, um, SPEC or SPCE, I'm looking at the weekly chart, right? We look at the MACD is about to turn red. It's about to come down. So why would I buy it here when I know it's gonna come back down 
and buy buy back up at 17. That's when it will go into my portfolio. Not right now, but when it goes to 17, I'll, I'll add some my portfolio at that time. Um, knowing that you know earnings are coming up, it may do good, it may do bad, we don't know. But looking at how we chart, right? We, we chart this on a five minute chart every day. We look at stocks. Uh, we know that when this, this is about to turn red and the RSI is about to go below 50, uh, we may see some dip coming down to back to 20 or somewhere like that. So why not wait for that dip to happen before getting in? And we might as well wait. So that's what I mean by not getting in right now, waiting for, for some of these to kind of come back down, turn around a little bit. Um, you know, square, we've been talking about square for a little bit. Another great example, right? That's a big red candle, guys. We know that. Uh, we talked about it possibly coming down to 200. Um, so why not buy it at 200? Why should I buy it right now when it's at 221? Um, every penny counts. So I'll just wait for, for it to come back down. Magdi wants to turn red, that's fine. Um, once the Magdi turns green again, I'll get in. Every time the Magdi turns green or turns red, um, I know that's gonna start dropping and I'll start getting in when it's, when it's going back up. So that's what I mean by steps uh, stepping in slowly but companies like Tesla um, and Arc uh, and Apple, I think they have short-term or even uh, Palantir have short-term catalysts coming up in the next three to six months that I think we should be able to take advantage of very quickly as we continue to move on. So um, I know I took a long time. Oh, wow, one hour. So we usually do this for an hour every Wednesday and, and Sunday. Um, it's a different topic every time. Um, next week uh, on Sunday, it's going to be spreads, call spreads, put spreads, because we've been doing those a lot. And a lot of people are asking what those are. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and do those on Sunday, trying to help you understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, what does it mean, what is break even, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to be Sunday's topic. Um, but I, I know we've talked about opening up a long-term portfolio, and I really want to get this out there before we start doing it, hopefully next week. So January, we'll, we'll, we'll dip our toes in. I want to get something in Tesla uh, before um, uh, before the uh, the numbers come out for China uh, or for the quarterly deliveries, which I think will be the first week of January. So um, that's why I just want to have some position in it. So I'm, I'll either do put spreads um, and take that profit and buy Tesla shares with it, or um, just start with the shares itself next week. And it'll be just a percentage, not not the full 800, 700 bucks, It'll be, um, I'm only putting in 500 bucks a month. So, so not, nothing too crazy there um, on this one. Okay. What about any questions? Do you guys have any questions? Um, maybe if you guys want me to chart some of these later on in, in, in another session, we can do that. There's some question, Arslan, on the chat. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I got my screen blocked here. Let me open that up. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Google's Waymo and Vet for Supply Chain. Okay, Vet, I will look at that. Um, okay, let's start with from the very beginning. Uh, Salim, Cruise, and Carnival stocks, Bitcoins, and crypto. Oh, great question. So, so Cruise stocks, um, we're not buying stocks on those, we're buying leap options. So, for Cruise and even airlines, American Airlines and Carnival, we're buying long term 2022 and 2023 call options. Uh, we're thinking they'll go back up and those call options will make us more money than the stock would, at least in the short term. Because I think once the, once Carnival goes back to 60, it's not going to go any higher. I think it will stay like the same range for a long time. But those call options will grow a lot faster um, in their near future um, uh, with that. And I think those plays are highlighted in our in our Discord chat where we've um, bought them um, uh, just, I think, a couple of days ago, we, we got in that position. And we'll, we'll go over that as well, if you want to, on Sunday. Um, Bitcoins and crypto, I'm I'm not too big on crypto. I know Bitcoin's going big right now, but I, I just, uh, to me, I, I can get the same percent return with options and with stocks. That I mean, to me, Bitcoin is just on the vehicle to get more returns, right? So if Bitcoin's making you, let's say, 50% a month, and I can get 50% using options, then why would I, uh, I, I, then I don't see a reason to switch over to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is good if you're not um, getting the returns you like on options and stocks, and you wanna try something different, 
then definitely yes, you could definitely dabble in that. Or you can buy stocks that you know correlate with Bitcoin, like Riot and Mara and all that stuff. Um, so you could do those as well. Uh, but for me, um, when I want to look at um, the uncertainty of Bitcoin and the returns and things like I can buy Tesla options and make the same returns monthly, um, I, I would rather do Tesla because worst case, I can buy 100 shares of Tesla um, and, and still have something concrete and that's accepted. Uh, VET for supply chain, I will check them out. I have not looked at them, but I will definitely look at that because um, that sounds interesting. Also, that's eliminate good. insurance. I haven't, I didn't put that in there. So, eliminate also is what I like. The V chain. That's actually a, a vet is the name of the cryptocurrencies. V chain. Oh, okay. It's a V-chain. cryptocurrency. They're. I think uh, right now they're partnered with Nike. Uh, they're partnered with uh, the Chinese state government. So mm-hmm. they're gonna have pretty much that whole market cap. Um, I think they're working with Intel, and they're also. Um, working in like major supply chains. Oh. So okay. they're, they're using that, that crypto or that blockchain for their services, the supply chain. And that is freaking amazing. Okay, that's cool. So so talk about disruption. I mean, that's that's crazy. Okay, BET, I will definitely look at that. Um, okay, let's see what's next. Um, Okay, uh, Waymo for uh, Google. Yeah, you know Waymo. Waymo is 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 good, but um, so my 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 thing is, if 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 Google is just going to do the software like they did with Android and kind of mm-hmm. lease out that software to everyone, um, it's not going to be any different than like an Android phone, right? It's going to every every car that you get into or whatever, like a Ford or Chevy, whatever car you get into that has way more software in it, um, may be the same and different at the same time. And it won't offer that one ecosystem experience like an Apple product would. And I think that's where, that's why I think Apple and uh, Google really needs to kind of understand that their, their intentions are good with software, but then when, when people when, when people get in and they um, uh, start manipulating the software to their liking or to the customer's liking, that's where that experience goes away. And with Apple, it's all about the experience. And, and when you walk on the Tesla, it's all about the experience. Whether you go into a Model X or Model Y, you can get in and know what's going on and the systems are pretty much the same on all of those cars. Um, and I think that's that's what people want. People, when they walk in, don't want to think about um, looking at another screen and re- readjusting their settings. Um, that they, they want to just be getting in and have the work done. And personally, right, I, I've had an Android phone my whole life, and then I got the um, iPhone success. And I, someone asked me how I liked it, and I and I said this this thing just works with my app on my Android phone, depending on whether I got a. Uh, a Samsung or a Huawei or you know, OnePlus, um, the experience was completely different, and I had to keep relearning some of that, some of those phones, and the hardware um, quality was different too. So, uh, Waymo, it, Waymo may may be good for for Uber, uh, may be good for Lyft, um, and so if some of those companies want to license the software, but I, I think the game. Um, is, is going to be a little bit more than what, what Waymo can produce right now. And I think Waymo is one of them. I think other companies are coming up with their own self-driving software um, that will compete with that as well. So it's going to be interesting. I like Google. If Waymo, if Waymo was its own company, I would like it. But if it comes with the whole baggage of Google, I, I don't want it because with, with Google, you're, you're getting, oh, hopefully they don't do that disastrous uh, Facebook com- uh, competitor again, but you're getting stuff like that, right? I think like 90% of products that Google puts out, they fail within the first six months. And that's just money being wasted and not really focused on one thing. Like Apple just focused on getting where they want to go. And Apple's looking around to see what everyone else is doing and trying to get through. You know, personal experience with, with Google as well in general, you know, we used to have these calls on, on, um, so I have an enterprise account with Google for, for Google Docs and, and Google, whatever this thing is. Um, 
So we used to have our calls through Google Meet, right? And it sucked so bad. The overall experience, the integration sucked so bad that Zoom is able to get in and I can set up my meetings through my calendar on my phone, get everything sorted and log in and start the meeting in one minute. Um, and Google Meet on their own platform could not get that done for me. So that was like, wow, Zoom, and, and we're just segueing back to Zoom at the bottom. The next question uh, was really good with integration, was really good with the simplicity of the platform. And I can get in from point A to point B very, very quickly. And that's why I like Zoom. But Zoom is a one trick pony, right? Zoom is good for meetings, but that's pretty much it. I don't know what else Zoom other than collect data for 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 a Chinese government, perhaps I don't know, but um, to me, Zoom Zoom uh, was was a pure COVID play. They're not worth the three hundred dollars that they're at right now. Um, as you saw, you know our our cost spreads paid out nicely today, um, and I, and I think Zoom is is going to eventually come back down to earth. Their valuation is way too high, um, unless they come out with something that can kind of go against you know. Salesforce in some way, um, but even Salesforce, you know, just bought bought, bought Slack uh, to compete with Microsoft uh, Teams and stuff like that. So I, I think I think Zoom needs to add into their um, uh, their 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 offerings a lot before they could be a a next ten year company. Um, if, if Salesforce comes out with with a Google with a Zoom replacement. I have no problem in switching over, especially if they can give me what I want. So um, Zoom for me is only just for meetings right now. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see any more questions. Nothing there. Any other questions, guys? I have a question. Sure. Um, are you familiar with uh, Jumia? It's yeah, yeah. Like yeah the, the African Amazon. Amazon. Of Africa. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, the African Amazon. I think I was just talking to someone about it the other day. Um, JMIA, correct? Yeah. So, oh, is this JMIA, right? Yeah, Juma Technologies? Yes. Um, so, yes. So, this is a growing um, uh, company. It's new. So, the only reason why I don't, I, I don't, I don't have it on my list is because it's too new for me to start in May, and I don't know enough about it yet. But it is on the short list to, to do more research on, just like Lemonade, um, and to possibly add on to the portfolio as well. The really cool thing about Jumia, and I think companies that are more organic to the, the countries that they're in, is that outside companies are having a hard time uh, getting into these other countries. Like for example, India, Netflix and Amazon are trying to get into India for so long, and they just can't really find a niche where they have, um, you know, organically grown Hotstar and other companies that are just eating their lunch every single day. Whereas I think Disney is partnering up with some of these companies now, like Hotstar, to get into the Indian market. Um, you've had Walmart try to get into India in, in the Southeast Asia market. They they failed big time. Uh, so they had to buy you know, other companies to get in, like Flipkart, stuff like that. Amazon's having a hard time getting in. Um, it's just because these other outside companies don't know um, – how, how the politics and how the people work or live in that country. Um, Jumia, I think, is really, really interesting play because Africa, believe it, or, believe it or not, is an untapped market right now. There's, I mean, Africa is, is, is on, the, on the growth of the next boom yeah, when it comes to technology, and no one is talking about it. And I think J companies like Jumia and companies and other companies are on there too. I'll have a whole list for you guys in a short time um, that can really um, uh, change the way not only Africa but the world does business because that those countries in Africa are getting the technology now and getting up to that second level um, where India is at now. And India has de completely changed in the last 10 years and I think the different countries in Africa are going to get there soon too. So I think Jumia is a very exciting play. I, might, I personally just have to do just a little bit more research um, before I'm comfortable in putting in my portfolio. But but yeah, great, great, great company. A great concept, I would say. Okay. Okay, thank you. I was um, mostly work, um, just 
wondering the way that it's different from Amazon. Amazon like has their own products and they have warehouses where Jumia started to do that. And then they started to do mostly like third party, you know, just being an outlet for other people. So, to be able so, to so sell kind of like the, uh, like the Alibaba thing. Right. Yeah. But then they also, they have, uh, I guess in Africa, the biggest problem was they were having a hard time getting payments to process and the payments were not reliable, like the, they wouldn't go through. Mm -hmm. So Jumia actually has Jumia Pay, which is like their own um, payment processing thing. So I don't know what you think about like long term. Is that like important? Is that oh, yes. something that would oh, make it yes. worth more? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, so when you said payment, so that that's all I needed to hear to put this in my portfolio, pretty much because that's. So I was I was watching this um, this interview with the uh, CEO of Mastercard. It happened like six years ago. I just watched the video again for the tenth time yesterday, as I was driving and uh, or listening to it, not watching as I was driving. And you know, f ten years ago, he was talking about Africa in that interview, and he talked about how, you know, when the gov the African government was was relaying uh now say african right I, I guess one country but I, there's one country in africa that he chose that he's talking about when he was uh when they were trying to uh, give payment to you know for social programs etc they determined that i think like 70 percent of the payments were being stolen because they were giving cash away being stolen before it even gets to uh the recipient so mastercard got into a program with this country and gave everyone mastercards um and, and and use those as payment so there's no middleman and they were able to get in and and use that um uh, mastercard and this was six years ago as payment and use for their ecosystem whatever but come now um the the credit card itself is obsolete um as we know it right it's all on your phone google pay apple pay um i mean square they're there for a reason and, and they want to eat up that technology, kind of like WeChat, right? WeChat in, in China, if you go over those countries and you try to pay with your credit card or cash, they may not even take your payment anymore. It's like, hey, we have WeChat, just scan my barcode and pay me here uh, rather than handling cash or a credit card going through a third party processor. So I, I think the US is behind when it comes to that that way of processing, that way of thinking. Um, my wife at one point was a a, um, a director of a, a credit card processing company and and she really was telling me how um, you know how much money they, they would make with processing and that that she 's already seeing the transition coming going away from credit cards and this was like two years ago she 's no longer in that line of business because she knows that that business is going away soon. Um, it's now coming to, you know, like, like Jumia Pay, where people who, who did not have access to make payments in the past are now going to be on the same footing as someone in the U.S. and now sending money back home, especially for a remittance, and for locally, um, if you're in a small village, you can pay with your phone. Everyone has a phone. Uh, just need a text message or a code, and you get it through. That's the future. I mean, it, it's it's you know we're stepping into that Bitcoin territory, right? Where it's secure and stuff like that. But it, it's it's the right way to go, and I think that's going to be the future um, for payments all over the world, not even just you know with Jumia. But America, for some reason, is so slow to adapt to these technologies. It's crazy, and that's why I have I like Square because Square is making that effort in the U.S. at least to get to that level. But yeah, Jumia is a great play, especially, I don't, I don't know about that payment part, but that just kind of seals the deal for me um, and getting that in my portfolio. Thank you for that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, long-term holds. Uh, do you ever intend to sell and buy back at a lower price or just continue to add? Um, yeah, never selling, just holding, holding, holding. And the, and the reason why um, is, is this chart for, for Tesla. Um, and of course, this is adjusted for splits. But if you were, let's say, when it starts to drop here, right? When it starts to drop here, you sell, and then hey, you know what? When it when it gets to the bottom, I'll buy it back up. And then if you're buying it back over here at 193, mm -hmm. guess what? You you missed that move from 68 to 193, or 68 to 200. Um, and for that reason alone, um, because we are looking at 
disruptive technologies that haven't really disrupted yet, they're going to disrupt soon. And we just don't know when that's going to happen. So um, right now, any price that you're paying is cheap. Uh, that's the way I look at it. 130 for Apple is cheap. If we're looking at 10 years from now, um, six, 700 for, for Tesla is cheap uh, 10 years from now. Yes. Um, so um, not selling at all, just buying and holding and pretending like it's not there every single month. So, um, so yeah, that was that. Um, any other, any other questions? Okay, well, if there's nothing more, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll clean this video up and of course it'll be available um, to our Discord channel first. So if you're part of our Discord channel, you will see this first before we load it to YouTube, uh, if we decide to load it on YouTube. So that's another thing. Uh, you Please join our Discord channel, uh, the link. Um, let me see if I can just post a link here so everyone can see it. That way, uh, if you know someone that can benefit from this lecture, I would say, um, please uh, send them the link. I mean, it's free. Uh, we don't, we don't charge you to share um, and you'll be able to um, uh, give the gift that keeps on giving. So there's a link in the uh, chat box. Um, please share, like, subscribe to our videos on YouTube. And if you want to know, you know, how to do something on YouTube or on, on, on Robinhood, or if you're working on a different platform and you go, hey, can you do a video on how to do something in Thinkorswim? Let us know so we can do those. I mean, I use Thinkorswim. I have the platform. Uh, Z and Shazad have the platform that are also part of the group. Um, they're, they're, the, they're the two other leaders of the group. So they, they'll do videos on it too. Um, just, just let us know what you want and we'll, we'll deliver. Um, with that being said, thank you for joining. I'll send this presentation out to the Discord group as well. So you'll have those two videos you can watch. Um, the first one by Tony Saba is really, really good. I recommend you watch it um, and buy that book. Okay, so with that being said, thank you for joining guys. I will see you guys tomorrow for the noon session. And of course, we'll, we'll see what the market has for us tomorrow. And tonight, I will send out the watch list for tomorrow. I have not forgotten about that. It may be around midnight, though. So watch it first thing tomorrow morning, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.